Welcome. Uh, uh, find a seat if you would. Thank you for coming out. Welcome to the final public event of a very busy week uh, of the Faith Film Philosophy 2023 series. I'm David Calhoun, director of the Gonzaga Faith and Reason Institute, which has organized the week's activities on the topic of multiverses and alternative realities, alternate realities, other worlds in film. The Gonzaga Faith and Reason Institute is dedicated to developing an integrationist understanding of faith and reason, particularly as articulated in the Catholic intellectual tradition. It does this in several areas, such as science and religion and philosophical theology. But the events this week, uh, the events of the Faith Film Philosophy series are devoted to showing the influence and relevance of Christian ideas in popular culture and as a lens for interpreting popular culture. The Institute's work is funded by the Father Robert J. Spitzer Society of Jesus Leadership Fund, which was created when Father Spitzer retired as Gonzaga's president in 2009. A great number of friends of Father Spitzer and of Gonzaga University have contributed to the fund over the years. A hearty thank you to Father Spitzer, the donors to the Spitzer Leadership Fund, and to President uh, Thane McCullough of Gonzaga University, who administers the fund and thereby supports the work of the Institute. For this support, the Institute is deeply grateful. I would also like to thank the speakers and panelists over the past week who have explored various ways that the cinematic device, devices of the multiverse and of alternate realities have been employed in recent popular film, especially over the last 70 years. That number 70 is, is uh, important. I'll come back to it in just a second. This has been a really exciting week. Tonight's speaker is film reviewer and professional critic, Stephen D. Graydonis. He's been writing about film since 2000 when he created the website Decent Films. He's a member of the New York Film Critics Circle and a deacon in the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Newark. He studied at the School of Visual Arts, St. Charles Borromeo Seminary and Immaculate Conception Seminary at Seton Hall University. Uh, Stephen has contributed to a number, actually I have a long list here and I decided maybe I won't read all of them, but uh, if you if you pay attention to film reviews online at all, you bumped into uh, Stephen Gradanis's uh, reviews, including uh, on on places like um, uh, uh, now I'm blank. I, actually, I thought I had it written down, but I don't. Anyway, in a number of places. Um, in addition to that, for 10 years, he co-hosted the Gabriel Award winning cable TV show Real Faith for New Evangelization Television, and he's appeared re frequently on Catholic radio. So lots of exposure dealing with uh, film and especially film and uh, religion. Several of our speakers this week have addressed this year's Oscar winner, Everything Everywhere All at Once, and related films that bend our understanding of reality. However, the speakers so far have only touched briefly on superhero films and the importance of the multiverse for that genre. That focus was what brought our speaker tonight to my attention, specifically the insightfulness of his reviews on films in the genre as they relate to theological and philosophical themes. His talk tonight is titled The Crisis of Meaning on Infinite Earths, Humanism and Nihilism in Superhero Multiverse Movies. Please welcome Stephen D. Gradanis. I'd like to uh, just quickly take the temperature in the room. If you would, uh, if you would do me the uh, uh, the courtesy, if you've seen at least one of the Spider Verse movies, raise your hand. All right, that's encouraging. Keep your hand up if you've seen them both. Very good. Okay. Um, Avengers Endgame. Okay. And one more. Loki season one. All right. This is going to be a good talk. Crisis of meaning on infinite earths. Where are we and how did we get here? It would be 
difficult, if not impossible, to overstate the investment in um, the multiverse concept of superhero movies of our era. Uh, just this year, we have had three major installments from different franchises focusing heavily on the uh, on the multiverse, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe MCU juggernaut, um, the latest movie, um, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, in, introduced us to a uh, one of many variants of the villainous Kang the Conqueror, and it's hard to see uh, in this um, in the screenshot, but also many of many uh, variants of Paul Rudd's Ant-Man um, in the quantum realm, which is a locus of one of many interpretations of multiverse theory. Um, the animated adventures of Shamik Moore's uh, Miles Morales in the Spider-Verse continued, which began in 2018 with Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and continued this summer with uh, Across the Spider-Verse. And while it was nowhere near as popularly or critically acclaimed as the Spider-Verse installments, we also got the latest installment in Warner Brothers' DC Extended Universe, uh, the Solo Flash movie, which, while not a great movie, does use the multiverse theme in some interesting ways, which are worth talking about here tonight. Um, the multiverse concept really went big in superhero storytelling in 2016 with Marvel Comics' Um, Doctor Strange, directed by Scott Derrickson. Uh, multiversal concepts later appeared in Avengers Endgame and in the last couple of Spider-Man movies, kind of, sort of. Uh, but what DC, what Marvel is calling the multiverse saga, really got underway in a big way in 2021 with uh, Loki, the first season of Loki on, on Disney+. Plus. Uh, the multiverse saga has continued with uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, with the Doctor Strange sequel, The Multiverse of Madness. And the Multiverse Saga takes its next big step forward with Loki season two, which debuts, unfortunately for this talk, next week. It's a little frustrating to think that in some parallel world, perhaps just a couple of dimensional clicks away from ours, there's an alternate version of me talking to alternate versions of all of you a couple of weeks after the debut of Loki season two. That said, while we would have to go significantly further afield in time and space to find a world where we're all able to consider the third Spider-Verse movie, I'm sure many of us will agree that for the purposes of this seminar, that world is the best of all possible worlds. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Um, more generally, the, um, the history of multiverse superhero storytelling actually goes back 70 years. In the earliest comic book superhero stories, each hero was introduced in what was effectively a self-contained world isolated from any others. Uh, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman in what would come to be the DC world. And from the company that would come to be known as Marvel Comics, Captain America, Namor the Submariner, and the original Human Torch. Um, by 1939, though, superhero crossovers began with Namor pitted against um, uh, the Human Torch. And on DC, they very quickly introduced um, Superman, Batman team ups, the Justice Society of America, and so forth. And then in 1953, something interesting happened. Um, here, yes. Um, in, a, in a Wonder Woman story, uh, we were introduced to what Wonder Woman called the twin world existing alongside Earth in which everyone is a double of everyone else, including double Wonder Womans. Um, this early story of two Wonder Women, an early exercise in multiverse storytelling was at that time just a, an interesting concept for, for a one-off story. Um, but pretty quickly, DC Comics found reason to integrate multiverse storytelling in a more thoroughgoing way into their, um, into their adventures. What happened was this. In the mid-1950s, the world of comics underwent a significant transformation. Uh, what comics historians call the golden age of superhero of superhero comic books ended and the silver age began. At Marvel, this was a time of enormous creative growth, a huge leap forward with the introduction of the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, the Avengers, the X-Men, and so on. Uh, the transition at DC was a little bumpier 
I should, for the sake of full disclosure, I should, it's obvious by now that I have more than a passing interest in comic books as an art form. And I should, I should reveal that I've always been uh, more of a Marvel guy than a DC guy myself. And Spider-Man has always been my favorite superhero. Uh, all of that said, I think when we look at what DC was, was doing at the time, the reason for what happened later will soon become apparent. There were some new heroes introduced, Martian Manhunter, Supergirl, Batgirl. Um, Superman himself became vastly more powerful than he had previously been. Batman lost his dark edge in his crime-fighting milieu and became a kind of cheerful do-gooder adventurer as similar as possible in spirit to Superman, who was more popular and successful at the time. Um, it was probably that, um, that unevenness of execution at DC that led to a nostalgia for the earlier golden age. And this paved the way for a new kind of crossover movies or a new kind of crossover story. Um, we began seeing crossover stories where the current silver age heroes encountered their golden age predecessors who were revealed as living on a parallel world. Uh, perhaps a little counterintuitively, the world of the new Silver Age superheroes being the main DC continuity at the time was dubbed Earth-1, and the world of the original Golden Age heroes was dubbed Earth-2. And before long, there were other worlds introduced. Earth-3, which was a sort of dark mirror image world of our world where all the superheroes were supervillains. Earth-X, where the Nazis won World War II. earth C and C minus, funny animal worlds with funny animal superheroes. Uh, from time to time, DC would acquire the rights to characters who were originally published in other, uh, by other publishers like Fawcett Comics, the publishers of the original Captain Marvel, the one who says Shazam and, and is now called that because Marvel just took the name for their own guy. Um, and DC just merrily rolled these worlds into their ever-growing, ever more convoluted and haphazard multiverse. Then in the 1980s, something very significant for our purposes happened. Under a range of economic and other pressures, DC decided to undergo a massive reboot of its, of its worlds in a diegetic story called Crisis on Infinite Earths. And and now those of you who are not ner comics nerds in the audience know as the nerds already did the inspiration for the title of my talk. Uh, this was an effort to streamline, simplify, and modernize the DC multiverse. And what came out of the end of this crisis was a single continuity, a single universe inspired by the best of the gold and silver and bronze ages of comics. The modern age of comics was underway. Multiverse theory in its myriad forms um, encounters resistance from many different groups of people for many different reasons. In the scientific community, it has its uh, scoffers from those who say that it's not even scientific because it's non-verifiable and non-falsifiable. Um, in the world of apologetics, there's a deep suspicion of the idea of the multiverse uh, rooted in the suspicion that it's a, um, a non-believer's way of responding to apologetical arguments along the, the, along the veins of fine-tuning or uh, anthropic coincidences. The idea is it's a kind of non-believer's Hail Mary pass that explains the hospitability of our universe as a kind of um, the inevitable, statistically inevitable winner of a multiversal lottery among all of the various multi realms of the multiverse that couldn't support our life. Um, much like, you know, much like our planet is the uh, inevitable lucky winner in a, in a, in a multiverse, in a, in a visible universe, uh, Hubble volume or whatever of 10 million billion billion planets, you know, you're going to, you're going to have the one, the lucky one. Um, still another objection comes from a certain kind of moralist who says that um, the multiversal concept is debilitating to moral thinking and may even be antithetical to the concept of morality itself. For example, if Hitler always wins and always loses on infinite worlds, infinite numbers of times, then someone might reasonably wonder just how deep of a, a moral obligation any of us has to really suffer and sacrifice to try to defeat him. And then finally, and this is most relevant to our talk today, in the world of narratology, 
there's a similar, if more modest, concern that multiversal storytelling is um, is antithetical to meaningful stakes in stories. It's hard to care about what happens in a particular story if you always know that right next door there's another universe where the opposite thing happens. Um, it can be reasonably felt that the 1980s crisis on infinite earths in DC comics represented an attempt to reclaim meaningful storytelling from multiversal morass. Not coincidentally, it can be felt that the MCU's trajectory has been kind of paralleling the evolution of the DC world, starting out originally with films with individual heroes, Iron Man, the Hulk, Captain America, and so forth, leading up to the unprecedented crossover that was Joss Whedon's 2012 Avengers, and then increasingly larger and always more common uh, crossovers between different superheroes and supervillains, culminating in the climax of the Infinity Saga with Thanos against basically everyone for the fate of half the lives on Earth. Um, when you go that big, where do you go from there? Unless you add other universes. Uh, so for phases four, five, and six, the Infinity Saga give, gives way to the Multiverse Saga. This is just the current plan for phase six out of the whole Multiverse Saga. Um, Tom Holland's uh, so attractions in this Multiverse Saga include a story in which the current incarnation of a hero Tom Holland's Spider-Man, meets previous versions of himself, played by Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, just like Earth-1 and Earth-2 in Silver Age DC storytelling. Um, earlier this year, we saw the same thing from that Flash solo movie, which brought back no less than Michael Keaton as old Batman and George Clooney as really well-preserved Batman. <laughs> and a bunch of rather tasteless... Um, computer fudged post posthumous um, cameos by Christopher Reeve, George Reeves, and um, um, Adam West. More significantly on the Marvel side, in Jonathan Major's Kang the Conqueror, a version of whom was first introduced in Loki going by the handle, He Who Returns, uh, we have a villain whose nihilistic scope of action is exponentially beyond Thanos. After all, Thanos only wanted to kill half the people in one universe. Um, the scope of action from He Who Remains or from, um, from Kang the Conqueror is inconceivably beyond that. Uh, the big question, of course, is, is the MCU's multiverse escalation a narrative solution or a new kind of narratological problem? Um, is the multiverse version of the MCU, like pre-crisis DC Comics, becoming too convoluted and too difficult for even modestly invested fans to really care about in the long run? Uh, will the MCU, in fact, eventually need streamlining on a kind of crisis on infinite or, uh, crisis on infinite Earth style? Not by that name, of course, or anything actionably similar. These narratological questions. And the real world um, questions, moral questions lurking behind them are not simple. I do think that there's a sense in which the more that we learn about the MCU, the more nihilistic a place it seems. I'm not convinced though, that this is intrinsic to multiversal storytelling. Um, I'm not convinced that, which is another way of saying, of course, that I don't think that the multiverse hypothesis is necessarily debilitating to real moral thinking. I'm not convinced that hostility to multiversal concepts from either a scientific or a religious point of view is necessary. I think we should be open-minded about multiversal hypotheses in the real world, which is another way of saying I definitely think we should be open-minded toward them in fiction. We're here to talk about fiction, but if I have time at the end of the talk, in the time that I'd like to be talking about the third Spider-Verse movie and Loki season two, I'd like to return to the real world questions. Um, my main concern about the MCU multiverse is an extension of my main concern about MCU storytelling in general, which is that the bigger the stories get, the less room that there is, not so much for God or for evidence for God, but for what you might call avenues of access to God, signposts to meaning, to some kind of um, moral structure or principle at work in the world. To begin to explain what I mean, let me um, let me give you a real-world illustration. 
about five years ago, early on a Friday morning, um, I awoke from a dream about an old friend in college and a strong impression that I should pray for him and specifically offer my Friday penance for him that day. A couple of days later, I learned that that Friday, my friend was in a horrific accident. A, a truck broadsided him, completely totaled his car. Um, to his amazement, he walked away without a scratch. If I were to take this microphone and walk around the room to all of you, I'm sure that many of you would have stories similar to that. I can see people nodding. Some of, some of those stories might be less dramatic than the one that I just told. Some of them might be more dramatic. And there are good reasons to bring critical caution to um, experiences of this kind, which are sometimes called synchronicity. After all, the law of large numbers means that striking coincidences do happen by chance, and our perceptions and interpretations are well known to be colored by a large number of cognitive biases. Um, there is the, um, the tendency to perceive meaningful patterns in potentially unrelated phenomena um, called apophania or sometimes pareidolia, usually in connection with perceiving visual patterns like faces. And there's the tendency to notice or emphasize data that supports our preferred way of thinking and to downplay or simply forget data that doesn't, form of confirmation bias. I mean, if my friend hadn't been in a horrific accident, I probably wouldn't even have remembered that I felt that impetus to pray for him. Um, so how many times have I had impressions like that in my life that weren't later confirmed by dramatic incidents? I mean, I don't remember any, but you see the problem. And yet all of that said, I think any of us, even the most skeptical and rigorously rational at particularly striking moments in our life may experience a profound sense of apparent meaning in seemingly chance events. A sense of what might be called a higher power or a cosmic law at principle at work for our good or potentially our harm if it seems like the universe is conspiring against us. For those open to such things, such moments may appear as possible signposts of meaning, glimpses into the workings of what, depending on our worldview, we might call karma, fate, divine providence, or other names. And I tell that story because there's a moment like that in the first Iron Man movie, directed by John Favreau back in 2008. It's a moment of moral clarity for Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark following two dramatic experiences. The first is a nearly fatal encounter with one of his own company's weapons, weapons that have fallen into the wrong hands through corporate malfeasance and Tony's own executive irresponsibility and moral casuistry. Had Tony been killed by his misappropriated weapons, some might see karma at work in the world punishing Tony for his failings. But instead, Improbably, one might say, almost miraculously, Tony survives. And not only the weapon, but he survives his subsequent captivity by terrorists. And the conversion of these two extraordinary events, the sense of synchronicity, sends Tony in pursuit of a path of redemption. I shouldn't be alive, he says, unless it was for a reason. Whose reason? Tony doesn't know and doesn't say, and the movie doesn't care, and that's okay. If there is a benevolent higher power or law or principle at work in the world, and if at certain striking moments in our lives, an intentionality or significance of seemingly chance events becomes apparent to us, it may not be necessary either to give it a name or to have any particular theory about how it works to take the hint and benefit from its gifts to us in the world. So far, so good. But what does any of this have to do with the multiverse concept? Simply this, the more that we learn about the MCU multiverse, the more that sense of meaning in experiences like Tony's moment of clarity is undermined. And not just that moment. To give another example, in last year's Thor Love and Thunder, Natalie Portman's Jane Foster is struggling with a diagnosis of stage four cancer. And a friend tells her, you're not getting what the universe is trying to tell you. This, again, is a statement of a kind that 
often seems meaningful in real life, a kind of interpretive leap of faith that we hope may on occasion give us insight into the ways or designs or purposes of whatever powers that be may be. All of this is undermined by the revelations of the multiverse saga, which turn out to be another variant, you might say, of a particular type of revelation that the MCU has been giving us from the very beginning. The most dramatic example so far of this undermining comes in the finale of Loki season one. This series finds an iteration of Tom Hiddleston's Loki, the powerful Asgardian god of mischief, detained by something called the TVA, or Time Variance Authority. TVA is an inconceivably powerful transdimensional bureaucracy with a quasi-religious mission of preserving what they call the sacred timeline, the preserved shape of which is reportedly prescribed by a trio of wise and benevolent divine beings called the timekeepers. It seems like there was once a wild and woolly multiverse in which interdimensional war broke out, uh, something about Kang the Conqueror, a human multiversal warlord, and a whole lot of Kang variants, an entire council of Kangs, in fact, cooperating across time and space until some of them stopped cooperating and go to war. Oh, no, not yet. I thought I might have a picture of uh, the Council of Kangs up there. And then we're told the war was ended by the appearance of the timekeepers who established the sacred timeline to prevent further multiversal wars from breaking out in the future or the past or any other part of the sacred timeline. To this end, they founded the TVA, agents of whom are charged with intervening in what are called nexus events. Nexus events are points of divergence at which, in a way connected with or reflective of the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, one form of multiverse theory, a person making a fateful decision may somehow realize multiple possibilities in branching realms of reality, in effect following multiple threads in a choose-your-own-adventure story at the same time, so that the person himself branches off into multiple realities created by their choices. The main Loki of the TV show is detained by the TVA because the only authorized version of Loki is the one who was killed by Thanos in Avengers Infinity War. And in the sacred timeline, unsanctioned variants are ultimately ontological orphans because um, the TVA, when they discover events giving rise to alternate realities branching off in unsanctioned directions, proceed to prune those branches before they grow out of control. So the TVA ultimately exists to prevent the multiverse, or at least to limit it to a number of safely convergent timelines around certain critical nexus points, a sort of crisis on Infinite Earth's management team. Not that they would call it that. It's interesting to compare and contrast the TVA with another multiverse policing organization revealed in this summer's Across the Spider-Verse, the Spider Society since it's a multiverse policing organization made up by different spider power people from different dimensions, it kind of has a, uh, a TVA and also a Council of Kangs vibe. Um, founded and led by Oscar Isaac's Miguel O'Hara, futuristic Spider-Man from 2099, the Spider Society's stated mission is protecting the integrity of those specific strands of the multiverse that concern the lives of spider power people. An intra-multiversal web that Miguel inexplicably calls the arachno-humanoid polymultiverse. Despite the fact that, as Miles points out, Spider-Verse is right there. Unlike the TVA, the Spider Society obviously is not worried about variants as such, but they do police what they call anomalies, which we're told means people who wind up in the wrong dimension, very roughly corresponding to the TVA's attention to nexus events in the sacred timeline. The Spider Society is concerned with multiversal nodes that they call canon events. This is a deeply meta term for the deeply meta observation that um, certain patterns tend to recur in the lives of spider people across the Spider-Verse. One such pattern pointed out in the first movie is a traumatic early loss of a loved one, Peter Parker's Uncle Ben, Miles's um, uh, Uncle Aaron Mahershala Ali for Heli Steinfeld's Spider-Gwen, her best friend Peter Parker. 
Like the approved outcomes of nexus events in the sacred timeline, canon events carry a prescriptive force. They're how the story is supposed to go. They're the connections that bind our lives together, Miguel says. But just as nexus events can give rise to unsanctioned outcomes, the connections represented by canon events can be broken, specifically by anomalies, by persons displaced in the Spider-Verse. Now, if this notion of how the story was supposed to go were just a, um, an interpretive theory or um, um, a cost-benefit analysis, that would be one thing, uh, narratologically speaking. It would be old hat. In fact, we get a version of this old hat from um, Jake Johnson's Peter B. Parker, who points out that if not for Uncle Ben's murder, most Peter Parker Spider-Mans wouldn't do what they do. Uh, so just think of all the lives saved because of what Uncle because of Uncle Ben's murder, which, okay, fine. But the idea of canon events is how the story is supposed to go gets an extra kick when we see exactly what happens when a canon event is disrupted by an anomaly. Say, Miles intervening in the life of an Indian Spider-Man by saving the life of a police captain who was supposed to die for what it's worth following a pattern in the comics going back to 1970. The apparent consequences of this canon event disruption are not remote and linear, like happy-go-lucky Indian Spider-Man doesn't undergo necessary character development leading to more effective superheroing in the future. Um, the effect is immediate and, for lack of a better term, ontologically destabilizing. Apparently in direct response to Miles saving the life of someone who is supposed to die, the Indian Spider-Man's world starts unraveling a hole in the multiverse, a so-called quantum hole, forms at the scene, manifesting as an alarming zone of dark chaos in energy or something. Uh, the spider society seems to have tech to contain the hole, at least for the moment, and they may be able to patch it, uh, but, the but we're told that thwarted canon events can destroy entire universes. In fact, um, Miguel says that he himself caused the annihilation of a universe by trying to take the place of a variant of himself after that variant died. So clearly there are lots of unanswered questions here. What is the actual principle involved in how the story is supposed to go? What mechanism is responsible for the formation of quantum holes and the unraveling of a universe? What dark secrets is Miguel not sharing with his team? These are questions for which we look to the coming third Spider-Verse movie to answer. For the time being, here's what I think we can say. First, from the outset, it's pretty obvious that there are reasons to distrust both of these multiverse policing organizations, the Spider Society and the TVA. Let's take the TVA first, since Loki season one gives us significant closure on that front. It, there's no crying in baseball, and there are no spoiler warnings in seminars. But even a person watching Loki for the first time, if they'd seen a number of spider of, of MCU movies, if they if they hadn't known anything about the comics, no one would be surprised by the revelation that um, the entire narrative that the TVA is based on, the supposedly divine benevolent timekeepers in their sacred timeline is a big lie. The timekeepers are mere figureheads literal puppets, mindless androids, created to put a divine facade on what turns out to be a very human enterprise. The real mastermind behind the TVA is in fact just one of the many variants of the same human as Kang the Conqueror. Um, a 31st century scientist named Nathaniel Richards played in multiple iterations by Jonathan Powers. And somehow, one variant succeeds in isolating a single timeline without any of his counterparts, and then, to keep it that way, to prevent multiversal war, this variant, going not by Kang, but by He Who Remains, creates the TVA and the line of the sacred timeline and the supposedly divine timekeepers. The reason that these revelations about the TVA's big lie are unsurprising is that the idea of debunking or exposing the powers that be as at least untrustworthy, if not fundamentally compromised or corrupt, is the single big idea in MCU storytelling. Almost the only idea. If the MCU had a moral, it would be, don't trust the man. 
And this turns out to have surprisingly far-reaching implications. MCU storytelling is replete with powerful, patriarchal, and sometimes godlike establishment figures who invariably turn out to be compromised by damaging secrets and who misrepresent their true nature or intentions. A good upper mid-level example is Anthony Hopkins' Odin of Asgard. Odin Allfather, both Thor's literal father and a more or less literal god, ruler of the MCU as guardians, identified as beings from another dimension. The first Thor movie introduces Odin as a um, wise, benevolent patriarch and a respectably godlike arbiter of moral worthiness. Later, though, it's revealed that Odin sits on a throne of lies, in fact, a throne of blood. The back In giving Thor's backstory an anti-colonial twist, 2017's Thor Ragnarok, directed by New Zealand filmmaker Taika Waititi, reveals the truth of Asgard's founding, which Odin has literally covered up with iconography, a violent history of conquest, possibly the equivalent of war crimes, perhaps even genocide, culminating in the disappearing and memory holding of Odin's one-time war leader, Thor's bloodthirsty older sister, Helena, Hela, played by Kate Blanchett. That's just one example. The roots of the theme go back to the original Iron Man with Jeff Bridges' Obadiah Stane, former colleague of Tony's late father, and a kind of surrogate father figure to Tony, seemingly the affable and responsible hand at the helm of Stark Enterprises in contrast with Tony's frivolous playboy lifestyle. Stane turns out to be trafficking Stark Industries' weapons to terrorists and in fact is plotting to take Tony out of the picture, which, from one perspective is why Tony was nearly killed by one of his own weapons. And Tony's actual father, Howard, isn't a lot better. Not only did he leave Tony a legacy of war profiteering, uh, but he also, like Odin, he rewrote his own history, among other things, covering up his role in the deportation of an unscrupulous colleague, Anton Venko, who contributed to Stark Industries' greatest nonviolent achievement, the arc reactor, a contribution that was just erased. When Venka's son, Ivan, a.k.a. Whiplash, comes after Tony in Iron Man 2, like Hela and Thor Ragnarok, he has a grudge against the hero's father, which is not undeserved. The same is true of Michael B. Jordan's Killmonger, coming for the late Chadwick Boseman's Black Panther over the misdeeds and cover-ups of his generally noble father, King T'Chaka. And let's not omit Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D., who I think is the only other one with an eye patch. Um, like T'Chaka, Nick Fury is basically a good guy, but he lies to the Avengers about S.H.I.E.L.D. supposedly being involved in clean energy research when what they're really doing is building super weapons. And Fury's good intentions notwithstanding, we see later that S.H.I.E.L.D. itself has been secretly corrupted, infiltrated, and subverted by HYDRA, a terrorist secret society with Nazi ties. Never trust the man. The same pattern plays out in varying forms in other installments, from Doctor Strange to Guardians of the Galaxy 2 to Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings. Significantly for our purpose, its most exalted and overtly theological form comes in the 2021 film Eternals, directed by Chloe Zhao and based on one of a number of sprawling mythologies from the fertile mind of comics legend Jack Kirby. Eternals opens with a literal creation myth drawing directly on Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, opening titles tell us, before the dawn of creation came the celestials. Their leader, the prime celestial, is named Arashem, and he created the first sun and brought light into the universe. We then hear about the arrival of the deviants, an unnatural species of predator whose origins are initially unexplained, but whose attacks on intelligent life prompt Arishem to send Eternals, essentially the first superheroes, to battle the deviants and defend intelligent life on planets like Earth. In this seemingly dualistic mythos, Arishem is something a lot like the Lord God in Genesis 1. And, it's, and the, the Eternals and Deviants are like angels and demons in Christian theology. Significantly, the Eternals have names overtly resembling those of gods and heroes of ancient mythology. Angelina Jolie plays Thena, as in Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom and war. And there's an Icarus, 
a Circe, a Gilgamesh, and so forth. The implicit can see is that the Eternals are not named after the gods and heroes of mythology, but that diegetically it's the other way around. The Eternals are presented as the historical reality behind many human myths and legends. It's worth noting that Kirby, who was Jewish, gave at least two of his celestials in the comics names evocative of Jewish religious language, echoing the Jewish prayer called the Shema, or Shema Yisrael, um, from the Hebrew word meaning hear or listen. There's a celestial called Ashema, the listener. And then there's Arashem, which is vaguely suggestive of Hashem, a Hebrew circumlocution for God, literally meaning the name. Now, to be fair, there's a bit of happenstance here because in the comics, Arashem is just one of a bunch of celestials and not the primal creative figure that the movie makes him. Kirby called him Arashem the judge. And since Ari in Hebrew is short for Aya, meaning lion, Arashem could be translated God's lion. Not a bad name for a cosmic judge. If he didn't want to call him something like Danishem or Danny L, although I guess you wouldn't get the desired celestial effect with Daniel. Um, in any case, the Eternals, Eternals offers more than a hint that all of this business with celestials and deviants is the real background, not only for much Greek and Mesopotamian mythology, but also for Judeo-Christian belief. Capping everything else, the closing titles play over images of legendary and religious figures, including St. Michael the Archangel, overlaid with visual cues, in this case, the glowing eyes, identifying them as really eternals. This kind of rather crafty construction of uh, Christian belief is a striking departure for Marvel, which has generally been careful to demythologize its own heritage in order to avoid religious complications. Anyway, ultimately, Arashem's dark secrets are revealed. And of course, it turns out that everything that the Eternals believed is a lie. I know you're all shocked. The Deviants aren't dualistic creatures of darkness. They're creatures of the Celestials, same as the Eternals themselves. The original intention for the Deviants was to promote the development of intelligent life by eliminating dangerous predators. But they went rogue and became all out-of-control predators themselves, so the Eternals were created as damage control. As for the Eternals, they're shattered to learn that they themselves aren't actually alive. They're just fancy robots with fake memories. The big twist, though, is that the Celestials aren't altruistically interested in life, intelligent life, for its own sake. They create and foster intelligent worlds like the Earth as a means of growing new Celestials. A planet like Earth is essentially a giant egg with an embryonic Celestial at its core. And what incubates the giant egg is the collective life force of intelligent species like ours. So when the intelligent population of a world grows and grows until it reaches a critical level, there's an apocalyptic hatching event and the shattered dead world is left behind. I'm not even gonna go into the preposterous, vaguely Malthusian resonances of, of this idea. I mean, not when we're talking about a movie that posits that global warming is caused by the quickening activity that's ha happening at the core of the earth. This is not a movie with a coherent environmental message. I do wanna highlight though, how most of the Eternals react to the realization that their whole worldview is a lie and that the humans that they have come to care for are doomed. To save the earth and humanity, they undertake an audacious plan to abort the, celest the hatching celestial. Yes, a celestial abortion to save all life on Mother Earth. The Eternals debate their moral quandary from a number of different angles. For one thing, they say, just as every, um, every egg hatched means more eggs, so more celestials means more Earth-like worlds. So if the Earth is saved, how many inhabited worlds that might have existed will never come to be? No one asks why anyone should care about such worlds, also destined to be snuffed out once they become populous enough. Nor does anyone fully confront the moral implications of the proposition that hatching new celestial, hatching new celestials is what the whole system is designed for. The earth, human beings, and eternals. It's our purpose. The Eternals are literally machines designed to fight demons, and the Earth and all life on Earth is just 
a more complicated kind of machine. This includes human beings whose creator fashioned them not in his image or out of love, but as necessary components in a planetary hatchery. What basis would anyone have, human or celestial, to challenge the moral acceptability of the celestial system? Well, what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me thus? There's a familiar idea that we've all been exposed to, well explored in science fiction, that if an entity has real self-awareness, like um, uh, like even, even a machine like Data on Star Trek The Next Generation, it's a moral person with inherent dignity and moral rights. But this premise assumes that personhood itself has intrinsic value, an assumption that Arisham apparently doesn't share. What rights can we have that our creator would be obliged to recognize? In what moral system can we call him into account? I'm reminded of an old joke mentioned by C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man about the man who hears that with a certain stove, he can cut his fuel bill in half and thinks with two such stoves, he can heat his house for no, uh, no fuel at all. There are things that can be done by halves, but not by wholes. You can question authority and debunk the man a long way up the food chain, but if you take it to the very top, you may find that you've created a story in which no one can possibly, you, uh, you can, you've created a world in which no one can tell a story that has meaning. Now, Asham may not be the very top. The world of Marvel Comics generally acknowledges a being known as the one above all, who is about as close to the religious and philosophical idea of ultimate divine reality as you're likely to get in popular superhero storytelling. Now, whether a being of this sort will ever be allowed to be acknowledged in one of the Walt Disney Company's most lucrative cash cows remains to be seen. But let's suppose that the one of all does exist in the MCU or above the MCU or whatever. Um, even then, the premise of internals confronts us with an unavoidable existential question. Whoever or whatever the one above all may be, whatever his uh, moral principles, his standards, his will, his nature. What knowledge of those things can beings like us possibly hope to have? If we were designed not in the image of the one above all, but simply as cogs in a celestial machine to produce baby celestials, then as far as we know, our moral ideas about the dignity of personhood may just be epiphenomena of the celestial reproductive process. Our lives feel significant to us, but what possible reason can we have to trust those feelings? I'm not saying our feelings are necessarily wrong. Maybe they're right. Maybe the one above all agrees. The problem is not that our feelings are wrong necessarily. It's that they're rooted in an epistemically perverse situation an inherently deceptive reality in which any hopes that we might harbor for our moral sensibilities providing any sort of signpost of meaning, an index to or guide of any kind of moral reality, reality that would in principle be binding even on a being like Arashem, these hopes have no reasonable foundation that we can see. We're essentially in Gnostic territory. A good God may exist, but the world that we live in and that we know is the work of an inferior God whose interests and intentions are not at all for our good or our benefit. True moral knowledge in such a world is elusive. And now I'm finally ready to lay out the implications of what we learned about the multiverse from the end of Loki season one and how it bears on Tony's dilemma and Tony's moment of moral clarity. It turns out that the shape of reality as we know it, which possibilities are allowed to become real and which are not, which are nipped in the bud, is prescribed not by divine beings, but by one lucky survivor of a multiversal war among countless different versions of himself. So the overarching goal of preventing multiversal war is the reason that things happen or don't happen in the MCU. Or rather, in the sacred timeline, which is the entire history of the MCU up till the end of Loki season one, when the um, 
um, when he who remains is killed and the sacred timeline immediately begins splitting and branching off into uh, um, a complicated multiversal mess. So that by the end credits of Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, you've got, yeah, he's there this time, an entire council of Kangs all over again. Um, an ostensibly naughty problem that Loki season one raises regarding this scenario is, does this mean that no one in the MCU has had free will until now? Because all our lives have been scripted by a tyrant. I'm, I'm kind of amused by the, the really delicious twist on the more common moral objection to the multiverse, that the multiverse robs moral choice and free will of, of meaning for the in-universe critics of the uh, of the TVA, it seems that the multiverse must exist in order for free will to have validity. Uh, but I think that um, that the free will debate is basically a red herring. TVA oversight doesn't negate free will. It's just that everyone who uses their free will the wrong way is either abducted, incarcerated, and brainwashed, or else effectively shot in the head. Uh, perhaps I should say every version of you that misuses your free will or Every version of you that comes into existence as a result of using your free will the wrong way, or as a result of anyone else using their free will the wrong way, or anything else not going according to plan. And that's the point. Why do the Avengers beat Thanos? Why do they beat Ultron? Why do they beat Loki and the Chitauri? Because it was in the script, not the screenwriter script. The script of the TVA of He Who Remains. And not because He Who Remains was on the Avengers' side. He's not out to ensure the triumph of good over evil on one planet. His goal is simply to prevent multiversal war. So, for example, the script is also the reason that hundreds of civilians were killed in the Battle of Sokovia in Avengers Age of Ultron. Ultron ultimately lost because it happened to serve the interests of He Who Remains, but if Ultron winning would have served his interests better, that's what would have happened. I'll prove it to you. Do you want to know why Ultron had to lose? Why Loki and the Chitauri had to lose? Remember in Avengers Infinity War? When Doctor Strange scanned over 14 million timelines and found only one where Thanos ultimately loses after he wins? Let's recognize, first of all, that none of those 14 million possibilities was ever going to be allowed to happen. I mean, the sacred timeline may allow for some divergences on minor points, but wiping out half the lives in the universe has got to be at least a candidate for the most significant nexus point in the history of life in the cosmos. So that would mean that there's no strand of the sacred timeline in which Tony isn't almost killed in 2008 by one of his own weapons, doesn't survive the explosion and his captivity, and doesn't go on to become Iron Man. And that's because, on top of everything else, the defeat of Thanos is Iron Man's final achievement. And in over 14 million possible timelines, only Iron Man was ever going to defeat Thanos. So Tony was right. There is a reason that he survived the explosion and his captivity. It just isn't a reason that gives us any hope of moral insight into any kind of reality. Here too, we're in an epistemically perverse situation. And in such a setting, um, experiences of synchronicity betray us if we're tempted to view them as potential signposts of meaning. Um, to take a, a quick look at the, at the Spider-Verse, um, it seems clear that not unlike he who remains, Miguel O'Hara does have secrets from the people making up his organization. Um, I don't guess that Miguel is dissembling on quite the same level as the TVA's big lie. I, I don't suppose he's actually causing the quantum holes in response to thwarted canon events. So his narrative seems to hang together for a moment. The most crushing revelation, which is a real, no Luke, I am your father moment, is that Miles himself, is apparently a walking anomaly, even in his own universe, because the spider that bit him wasn't from Miles's universe. I'm not going to recount in detail the really astonishingly elegant way that Across the Spider-Verse weaves together Miles's established um, origin story from the first movie, the Kingpin's um, multiverse spanning collider with the multiversal villain in this movie, and the bagel gag in the first movie, which now becomes a serendipitous hat tip to last year's multiversal uh, everything bagel metaphor from everything everywhere all at once, which 
How does that even happen? What I will say is that according to Miguel, because the spider that bit Miles traveled from one universe to another to do it, in the first place, another universe now lacks the Spider-Man that it was supposed to have. And in the second, because of that anomalous spider bite, Miles wound up intruding in a fateful battle involving his world's original Spider-Man, the blonde, perfect Peter Parker voiced by Chris Pine. Um, and that, according to Miles, is why that Spider-Man died, which also was not supposed to happen. In fact, we're told that the reason the Spider Society exists was precisely to manage the downstream multiverse, multiversal consequences of Miles's origin story. In a brutal dressing down, Miles, uh, Miguel tells Miles, you're the original anomaly. You're not supposed to be Spider-Man. You're a mistake. Miguel shouts that he's lying, like Luke Skywalker, which means that he's probably not. But Miguel also can't be right. Not completely. For one thing, Miles's magnificent moment of defiance, his repudiation of Miguel's entire program with a monosyllabic, nah, followed by, I'm gonna do my own thing, is just too cool to be wrong. In that moment, he's as cool as Hobie, Daniel Kaluuya's anarchic uh, spider punk who opposes everything Miles represents and actively assists in the formation of a spider resistance led by Gwen's Spider Woman. Make no mistake, these are the heroes, which means that Miguel can't be completely right. Um, it also can't be right that Miles is supposed to accept the looming murder of the most Spider Man adjacent police captain in his life, who, as it happens, would be his own father, Brian Tyree Henry's officer, Jeff Davis following an unexpected promotion. Miles, of course, wants to stop that from happening. Miguel, of course, is determined to stop him from stopping it. Whatever happens in the next film will probably tell us a lot about the truth of the Spider-Verse and canon events. I've got a lot more talk than I have time. I didn't think I was going to go that long, so I'm going to have to, uh, to try to condense because there are th things that I want to focus on more than other things. So... Um, There's a lovely character moment when Gwen says to Miles, in every other universe, Gwen Stacy falls for Spider-Man. And then, of course, she dashes his hopes by adding, and in every other universe, it doesn't end well. Miles' response, though, is still hopeful and perhaps significant. Well, he says, there's a first time for everything, right? Miles is not yet aware of the notion of canon events, but this is the way that Lord and Miller think, too. There's a first time for everything. This is a liberating way to think about multiverses and about life in general. Um, as regards the MCU, well, I can't say I foresee any salvaging of the first three phases from the crisis of meaning concerns raised by the sacred timeline. This doesn't mean that the MCU is now a zone of sheer nihilism. There are some counter premises to consider. Um, to begin with, we just need to recognize that the theoretical unity of the MCU, the canonicity of the stories that it contains is fundamentally not a deep artistic construct, but a marketing device. Um, these are films and TV shows that were written and directed by a great many people with a great deal of non-collaboration across stories. And the only thing really situating them in a single continuity is the fiat of Kevin Feige. Tensions, differences, and outright contradictions abound. Is the moral universe of Doctor Strange and the multiverse of madness really the same as the moral universe of the original Doctor Strange? I'm sure you'll have no trouble believing that I could talk for an hour just on the theological implications of these two movies. Um, but trust me when I say uh, I don't think they share the same moral universe. So it's okay to enjoy the better stories in a franchise without feeling the need to apply every implication of every other film in the franchise. Um, it's also worth noting that the treatment of religious themes in the MCU is, is uneven. And while some of it definitely converges with what we see in Eternals, um, others don't. So for instance, in Thor, Love and Thunder, it opens ridiculing, it opens with a, a really nasty, um, God named Rapu ridiculing his last worshippers' um, hopes of eternal reward and his prayers for his dying daughter. 
And most of what that follows in the film suggests that as far as gods go, Rapu is more the rule than the exception. And yet that movie ends in a post credit sequence with Jane Foster having succumbed to her illness, arriving at the afterlife and welcomed to Valhalla by Idris Elba's Heimdall. The Black Panther movies likewise depict a spiritual realm called the ancestral plane, where it seems that the beatific departed souls of Wakandans can commune with the living with the help of a special herb connected with Black Panther's powers. The most complete account to date of religion in the afterlife is found so far as in the Disney Plus series Moon Knight, in which the protagonist played by Oscar Isaac dies and meets a goofy hippopotamus headed Egyptian goddess named Tuaret, who explains that he's in an afterlife, not the afterlife, adding, you'd be surprised how many different intersectional planes of untethered consci consciousness exist. So there you have it. I, the multiverse extends to the afterlife, an MCU multiverse of the spirit. Does this mean that all paths lead to some form of paradise or others? Another, apparently not, because it seems that in the MCU, there's also the possibility of eternal punishment. So Tawaret is depicted weighing the hearts of the dead on the scales of justice against the feather of truth, drawing on Egyptian mythology. She says that if your hearts are balanced in life, then you'll go to paradise, the field of reeds. Otherwise, the dead will drag you down and you will remain forever frozen in sand. This isn't the only indication of eternal punishment in the MCU. Souls of the damned also appear in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. What is the basis of judgment, reward, and punishment in the MCU's various afterlife? Uh, what are the conditions for attaining Valhalla or the Field of Reeds, and who defines them? For what sins and by what tribunal were the damned souls in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness consigned to perdition? We don't have answers to these questions, and we may never get them. But it does seem as if there's an interesting tension in the MCU between the nihilism of the cosmos and the general humanism of the ethos. That is, the universe of the MCU appears to cast grave doubt on the idea that life has meaning, but heroes are still supposed to act as if it does. So in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, a Doctor Strange um, Variant has the opportunity to save the multiverse by killing an innocent person. And he's going to do it. But our universe's Doctor Strange won't do it. And that tells us something about where the movie stands. The MCU exalts sacrifice, like Tony defeating Thanos, but it must be personal sacrifice, sacrificing others for the greater good is another story. Um, by now, it should be clear that while I find some value in the MCU, um, my heart belongs to the Spider-Verse. Among many, many reasons that this is true is the metaphorical power of the Spider-Verse in its characters' lives. In the first film, the Spider-Verse is a metaphor for um, connection, for finding your tribe, for meeting people who get you, recognizing what you have in common with people from very different worlds. In the sequel, on the other hand, it becomes a metaphor for the kind of loneliness that is characteristic of the digital era, knowing that people like you are out there, but having no access to them. Miles hasn't had that you're like me experience in over a year when the movie, um, when the movie opens. And as he talks to his parents about his friends from Peter to Gwanda, um, it turns out that they've all moved away. If it sounds as if he's making them up, he might as well be. I'm reminded of an old Calvin and Hobbes um, comic strip with the line, sometimes I think all my friends have been imaginary. The tension in the MCU between the nihilistic cosmos and the humanistic ethos resonates, I think, more deeply, the conflict between Miguel and Miles. Like the corrupted Doctor Strange, Miguel is willing to sacrifice individuals for the greater good of the multiverse. My hope for the Spider-Verse is that when Beyond the Spider-Verse comes, that what we learn about the cosmos of the Spider-Verse will vindicate Miles's ethos over Miguel's. And I think I'm just going to have to end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is obviously, I mean, thank you. Thank you for your passion for this. I, I have seen a lot of these films and was ready. Which one? Uh, so I have fully watched the original Iron Man. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, 
So I guess that, that relates to my question. For a casual viewer that is not likely to pick up on all eventual 496 million or whatever is in Paul or something, where do you feel the best uh the best avenue into the logical question would be? In, in, in other words, you know, I don't even have another life to learn all of this. I would love to, I just, I, I just, I just haven't really interacted with it. I could, I could get through it. But where would you, where would you start, or where would you, um, where would you say the average viewer has the best possible way of grasping any of this? If you're interested in um, watching another one of these movies um, that offers fodder for theological and philosophical reflection, I would recommend Dr. Strange. Um, Scott Derrickson, the director and co-writer, is a Christian, and um, he has a take on Dr. Strange and the multiverse that he inhabits, and the moral and philosophical um, categories there that I think are very interesting and that provide a very significant contrast to what I think is, is a much more disturbing interpretation in the multiverse of madness. I'll also mention that I have a difference of opinion with the director, Scott Derrickson, on some of those moral questions. Uh, he and I have talked about it. He, he thinks that my take is, is a little um, uh, rigid, um, but, uh, um, but he acknowledges that it's a valid way to approach it. So uh, if a movie allows for the possibility of different legitimate interpretations on significant questions like the morality of, of certain actions um, in the kind of cosmic scope that a movie like this uh, engages, I think it's worth watching. Um, but the movies that I, I would, I really can't recommend too strongly, watch Into the Spider-Verse. It's, uh, it's, it's just fantastic. So picking up on that comment, I have my view. Why do you think Spider Man is better than Superman? <laughs> um, Sorry. So I, I can't answer that question without being very personal. Um, I was I was born in 1968 and Spider-Man was five years old at that time. Um, I have no memory of a point in my life when I did not know who Spider-Man was. I grew up watching the 19th. That was the year that the 1968 cartoon debuted, the same year that I was born. And I grew up watching it on Channel 5 every day when I came home from school. Um, and it connected with me immediately in 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 my in my earliest connection because i perceived peter parker as being someone who was like me um he had problems that i could relate to he was he was much more human scaled than superman or even batman who you know in spite of having no no superpowers you know still has a life of impossible wealth and privilege um i think that where batman is tortured by tragedy spider-man is is was set on his course by an awareness of moral failing and and a, a purpose of amendment, and so I think that 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 sense of um, if I don't do what I can, other people are going to suffer the way that Aunt May and I have suffered. I, I think that that's powerful. Um, beyond that, I think my my identification with the character is really so strong and so personal that I probably don't have a lot of insight into it. But I think it's back that your your answer would be the answer for most in that a flawed hero as opposed to a perfect impossible to imitate hero has more connection so that all of Spike Lee's heroes have the possibility of you imagining yourself in their situation where you can't do that with people. I would like I would like to throw out a word in defense of Superman, who I also like as a character. Um, it's hard to write Superman well, but it can be done. Um, in there are a number of really strong Spider-Man stories: All Star Superman, um, uh, Kingdom Come, and and when you grasp the idea of Superman as an aspirational figure, and you learn to confront him with situations in which his powers are are aren't helpful because there's there's another kind of issue at stake. Um, then he can become a compelling character and a character who inspires us to 
uh, to think of our best possible self. Uh, but I do agree that it's a lot easier to write Spider-Man well and to relate to him and that Superman, it's very easy for a character like that to be boring. Thank you for a great talk. Go ahead. Not surprising. So would I have done if I if I weren't a critic. Right. So I think that the most troubling manifestation of that question so far has been in the Doctor Strange world. Um, the Doctor Strange that we see, the variant that we see in the beginning of the story, is has been corrupted by a, a book of the damned called the Dark Hold. And this is this is a book of enormous power, but if you use it, it corrupts you. And our Doctor Strange um, is at first determined never to use it. Um, he encounters other versions of himself who are variously compromised. In one world, he discovers that a version of him was considered to be one of the most dangerous beings in the multiverse and, and was taken down by a team, of, a, a team of superheroes to defend the multiverse. And, and by the end of the story, Strange crosses that line that he wasn't going to cross. He uses the dark hold. He commands the powers of demons. He, he's literally engaging in... Um, um, in, in Satanism in order to defeat evil. Um, I, I say literal in a, in a it's a, it's not entirely literal because although they're effectively, um, they're, they're the equivalent of demons, but they're, they're supposed to be damned souls. Although, like I said, we're not told for what sins they died. It, it's a very disturbing movie. And, um, and, and the, the path that it takes Dr. Strange on makes us see that we're told our Doctor Strange is different from the ones in the other universe, but then we learn that he's not. And that, you know, the movie ends with a credit that says Doctor Strange will return. And I'm like, why do I feel like that's a threat? So yeah, I, I think I think it is a significant, and, and so it's all, but, but because, like I said, these seemingly canonical stories are really not as tightly connected as Kevin Feige would have us believe. Uh, there's, there continues to be the possibility of good storytelling within this world, um, but it's also true that because these other stories loom so large, they place fearsome constraints on what kind of storytelling you can do. And that is obviously a concern. Okay. I, I identify with you also. Villainous ordering of the universe and the sort of um, chaotic adventuring that the superheroes do. Um, your your comment resonates interestingly with a discussion that we were having earlier today about um, the fall of um, um, is it now? Now I'm forgetting if it was in if it was in Tolkien or if it was an interpretation of the fall of Satan. Somebody, the 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 um the figure who falls out of a, a desire for disordered order. Anyone remember what we were talking about? Was it Sauron? Okay, I I've forgotten. I was all of a sudden thinking, was it Sauron? Is it Morgoth? Is it Satan in like Paradise Lost or something? Okay, yes, Sauron. Um, yeah, that that idea of of um, this is this is a way that has existed for a long time to make villains at least somewhat relatable. Um, that we see the villain as someone who is is um, um, goes to extremes in order to um, to try to achieve some kind of understandable end, and the end of achieving order is is an end that you can understand being taken to those those kinds of oppressive extremes. Um, it's definitely definitely the order of the of the sacred timeline versus the chaos of the multiverse. Um, that comes out at the end of, of Loki. Um, it, it's it's a it's really an expression of restriction versus free will, right? I mean, if you allow free will, then you are going to have chaos. Um, and so the villains, in order to achieve order, are going to impinge on free will. So um, I, I think that this is this is a dynamic that can be told in ways that are more interesting or that um, that that fail. And I think it, it it fundamentally comes down to the moral vision of the storyteller. So I think. 
I think what we're going, what we're likely to see in the third Spider Verse movie is going to be. I I suspect it's going to be a really interesting vindication of the right of someone like Miles to choose his own path and to um, to 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 believe and to have hope that if he's true to what he believes that there is a way to salvage the situation and that the universe doesn't just present us with tightly ordered paths that we must follow or the world falls apart. So, um, yeah, like I said, I, I wish we were having this, this talk after those, those two things had been released. We could, uh, I, I wouldn't be up here speculating as much as I am. Um, right. Now, you know, behind the church, uh, it's an avenue for God. Well, so suggesting that it's an avenue for God in the Spider Verse is complicated by the fact that I don't think that it's how the story should go. I think, I think, I, I don't think that Lord and Miller would have raised the idea of canon events diegetically in the story if they didn't intend to blow it up. I think that they chafe as creators under the idea that if they're going to tell a Spider-Man story, there are certain rules that they have to follow. Um, I think that they're all about finding completely new and unexpected ways of telling stories. Um, <laughs> it, it, there's a kind of a counterintuitive example of that in their movie, uh, in the, the Lego movie, where uh, the bland, um, almost mindless, conformist protagonist is able to challenge and inspire the genius level master builders to do something that the enemy will never expect when he says, what if you just followed the directions? Um, now that, that works because it's, it's pure satire. It's pure spoof. Um, the, the, the spider verse stories are taken significantly more seriously. And I think that the prescription that the, how the story should fold um, because when you look at the content of that, what is how the story should should unfold? Miles should allow his father to be killed. I mean, that's crazy. Um, if that's 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 a universe that I wouldn't want to live in, and I don't believe that Lord and Miller are going to end the story with, uh, well, Miguel was right, and you know, I mean, there are three possibilities that could follow if Miguel is right. If Miguel is right, either um, Jeff Davis dies, or Miles succeeds in saving him, um, and then his universe starts to unravel, or um, Jeff doesn't accept the promotion and doesn't become captain. That's how they resolved it with the, Gwen Stacy's father, who is also a police captain. He resigned from the force, and so that means that his death is no longer an inevitability. The canon events are really funny things. Um, but I don't think that any, any of those things are going to happen, because that would mean that Miguel is right. And I think what I really, really, really want to see is how is it possible that we see these quantum holes emerge when, when Miles saves the Indian police captain, and yet somehow Miguel is wrong. I really want to see that one. Right. Um, the um, the Silver Age era. One of the reasons why the Silver Age era was such a wobbly era for DC is because um, Superman became the archetypal superhero that he has been ever since, and and he became so, as the kids say, OP. Um, and 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 Batman wasn't allowed to be Batman; he had to be more like Superman. So. Um, um, and, and this really goes along with the world of the 1950s. It was the er Eisenhower era. It was, um, you know, Batman on television in the 1960s was, was a, a, you know, a, a cheerful, um, uh, duly deputized uh, partner with law enforcement. And um, 
Um, from the 1980s, comics were really reacting against that. You had the Dark Knight Returns, um, uh, Batman becomes a much more ambiguous character, and we really see much more um, the question of authorities as, as, um, as potentially corrupt, or at least questionable. The idea of questioning authority becomes much more significant in comics in the 1980s. And that idea is really lodged in Marvel, I think not fundamentally for any ideological reason, but actually as a reason to retreat from ideology. I think this is very clear when you watch the first Captain America movie and you realize that this movie is called Captain America and the hero with that name is not allowed to stand for any specific ideal associated with the United States of America. There's absolutely, he stands for decency and for goodness and for, um, you know, other kinds of generic virtues. But, but there's nothing specifically American about Captain America. And the reason for that is we want this movie to do well in China and we want it to do well in the Middle East. And, you know, um, so, so heroes aren't allowed to st in the MCU to stand for particular things. And so if you're not standing for something, then what can you tell a story about? Well, one thing you can tell it about is what you resist. And so you resist corruption. And so we ascribe corruption to authorities because it's a way to generate drama in stories. I mean, you wouldn't have the, the same drama in Avengers if um, Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Avengers were totally on the same page in fighting Loki and the Chitauri. What makes the story more interesting is that you have this tension between the heroes themselves because the authority figure isn't entirely trustworthy. And so that theme of the untrustworthy authority figure plays out, and as the stories get bigger and bigger, the authorities get bigger and bigger. Now they're not just government leaders or government agents, but they're gods, and then the creator of the world, and then the shaper of all of reality, time, and space. And, and this is where I think the danger of, of nihilism comes in. Sure. Okay. Well, considering that it was largely written by a Catholic priest, absolutely. Yeah, Father Father Daniel Lord um, was so in in the nineteen in the late, in the late nineteen twenties and, and early nineteen thirties. Um, the concerns for Hollywood to avoid government censorship um, led to an effort to apply self censorship. And the original list of don'ts and be carefuls, um, which was I. If it, I don't remember if it was actually written by Will Hayes, but it was at least enforced under his administration. It was really inadequate. And what Father Lord wanted to do, and he did it in partnership with um, Martin Quigley, who is a Catholic publisher, um, was to produce a document that was meant to apply a kind of a Thomist worldview to um, the morality of art. Now, one of the complicating factors was that art was seen at this time as um, an entertainment for the masses and not as an art form, it was viewed more in a, in a pedagogical way. It explicitly says in the code that in literature, you can deal with moral ambiguities and you can tell difficult and questionable stories because the audience is more limited, but everybody's gonna watch the movies. So we have to make sure that the moral messages are unambiguous. And this is what created some of the, um, um, the more questionable prescriptive choices in, in the Hayes Code. Um, I, I think that the intentions behind it are better than is often um, ascribed to them. And I think that the way that it was applied under Joseph Breen um, in, in the, uh, um, um, the so-called Hayes office, uh, Breen being a, um, a, a movie fan and, and a real fan of, of the art form, um, he made some very silly and very bad calls, but he also genuinely worked with filmmakers to try to um, achieve artistically significant results within the limitations of the Hayes Code. So uh, I should also mention that not everything in the Hayes Code um, or the, the production code was written by Quigley and Lord. And in fact, they were opposed uh, very violently to one of the, um, the clauses that was added um, in deference to the concerns of um, Southern film distributors, namely the miscegenation code, uh, the rule against depicting um, um, marriage between not just interracial, but specifically between white and black people. That was uh, forbidden by the code. And this was not added by Lord and, and, um, and Quigley and they were opposed to it. 
Did I answer the question? Oh, yeah, no, totally, totally. This is this is the really weird, I, there was an earlier version of this talk that was even longer where I talked about this specific issue. The comics, so the, the transition in the in comics history from the golden age to the silver age coincided with the introduction of the comics code authority so when when that self censorship um um code was was applied to comics uh, in order to address moral concern and outrage over comics the golden age ended and the silver age began what's really weird about the contrast between that and movies is that very largely what we call the golden age of cinema and the age of the production code administration overlapped so um in in comics self-censorship ended the golden age although for marvel it was the beginning of what you could more accurately call the golden age and in the comics there was this weird partnership between golden age Hollywood and this self-censorship. Um, but but they both grew from exactly the same social concerns. We're going to police ourselves so that we don't have to worry about other people policing us. And, and they both came out of the same kind of moral outrage, moral pressure from outside. There was um, a seduction of the innocent and, and a lot of other um, uh, moral concerns about the degenerative effects of, of comics on children. And because comics were aimed at children, the uh, the concern was even greater than in the case of movies. Uh, of, of, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the, of reasons to be. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Yes, yes, yes. I well, I'll tell you what I think. I think that um, I'm thinking of what C.S. Lewis writes in Miracles about um, coming to know nature better by the discovery of the supernatural. Um, I think that we discovered um, as, a, as a culture watching Star Trek that by watching, by exploring um, races and, and civilizations that were different from ours based on some aspect of human experience, but then abstracted and refined and, and altered so that it was no longer recognizably human. Um, we, we define ourselves in contradistinction, not only to the visible creatures that we see so that you come up with a definition of, of, um, of a human, um, as a, um, featherless biped, you know, or a rational animal. We wouldn't define ourselves as a rational animal if there were other rational animals. So by, even by imagining contrasting possibilities to what we are, I think we come to understand ourselves better. Um, I think, you know, we see C.S. Lewis doing this in Out of the Silent Planet. We see Tolkien doing it in The Lord of the Rings. And I think that there is a place for that in, in Christian imagination and speculation. Um, I mean, when if we imagine a world of human-like creatures that have no desire for God, um, I don't think that that undermines our self-understanding. It may it may illuminate it. Um, we understand God's freedom in a different way when we think about the things that He could have made and and either didn't, as far as we know, or you know, or perhaps you know, but perhaps He did. And and this is this is where. If I had been able to go into my own thinking about the multiverse, I'm I would be wary. I'm I'm I tend to be wary about putting constraints on the scope of God's creative activity in order to safeguard uh, His glory as we understand it. Um, very very quickly, um, I grew up in a Protestant household, and I was exposed to a kind of young Earth creationism. And the the impetus behind young Earth creationism is that if God didn't, if there was no time for evolution to occur, then we have a much more straightforward apologetical argument for look at all this organization. God clearly just created us. Um, in the, in the same way, you look at the you know the visible universe and you have that that argument um, for for the you can't say oh this Earth was clearly created for us if you have ten million billion billion um, planets in in the visible universe. So 
I don't want to say God wouldn't create a multiverse or didn't create a multiverse because that makes me happier with my apologetical ability to say, look at this fine tuning. Um, I, I, I think that we need to be comfortable with the idea that whatever, whatever God has created is for his greater glory. And if that includes the multiverse, then I'm very cool with it. I think our time is up.